welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by Loughborough University. This podcast seeks to bring together the worlds of academia and professional practice. If you're interested in the latest research and trends in sport, then this is the podcast for you. Today, I'm with John Steele, OBE. John has a unique blend of experiences in creating and leading high-performance teams. Developed as a professional athlete, sports coach, and in chief executive roles in private, public, and not-for-profit sectors. He served as an army officer, having been trained at the prestigious Royal Military Academy Sandhurst to lead teams in high-pressure environments. On leaving the army, he worked in the corporate world before becoming a professional rugby player, playing in over 400 first-class games. On finishing playing, John turned to coaching and successfully led Northampton Saints to become European champions before gaining CEO positions at a variety of sports organisations including the RFU and at UK Sport, where he was responsible for delivering a world-class high-performance sports system to enhance Team GB's success through the Beijing and London Olympic Games. In 2015, he was appointed as Executive Director of Sport at Loughborough University in order to grow its status as a beacon of sport in the UK and around the world. John has served two terms as the chairman of the English Institute of Sport and continues to be involved in various sports boards across the UK. Today, we're speaking to John about his journey into leadership in sport. John, thank you very much. Appreciate your time in coming on the podcast. No problem, Martin. Good to be here. Like I mentioned previously, we we often have a brief introduction from people, but with your background in leadership and the amount of roles that you've been in, I don't think this will be so brief. And it would be good for you to touch upon that journey of where you've been from starting your leadership um, career and how that's progressed along the way. So, so where did things start for you in leadership? It's an interesting one, isn't it, to identify that, whether it's sort of conscious or unconscious. I suppose like a lot of people, when I was I was born and bred in Cambridge, and when I went to school in Cambridge, I found myself in leadership roles there as captaining this sports team and that sports team. And I suppose the love of it and the feel of uh, when it goes well and learning from it sort of started that far back, really. But when I left school, I, I took a year off. Uh, I travelled, did various jobs, um, barman dustman um i went sheep shearing in um new zealand travel around with a shearing gang out there and did all that learned that i wasn't as good at rugby as i thought i was in new zealand um but then actually i suppose my understanding of leadership really started when i came back from new zealand i went to sandhurst military academy to train to be an army officer and that's where my sort of passion if you like for the subject of leadership came about the lessons that I learned there which you know I would have thought would have sort of lessened in their relevance after well how long ago is it now nearly 40 years my god that makes me sound old but uh, nearly 40 years ago uh, just as relevant today and I draw on them pretty much every day of leadership what I learned what I learned at Sandest and in many ways I think it's it was way ahead of its time and the sort, sorts of things that people are talking about now as being new. Sandhurst was teaching and, and training all those years ago for many generations of leaders. So I think that's where my passion for leadership came from. So let, let's touch upon some of those then. What, what are those key attributes that you were taught at you know, such a young age that you then implemented? What, what would you say they are? Well, it's interesting that the, the motto of, of, of Sandhurst is serve to lead. And as a as sort of as a raw young individual, you go there thinking, well, this is because I've been through selection and I've I'm actually um, I've been selected in my service to lead others. But of course, it's 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 a double meaning. And what it, what it really means is, in order to lead, you have to serve those you lead. It's it's the original uh, model of servant leadership. And if what's drilled into you right from the start is, you have a huge duty of care to the people in your charge you have to look after them and, and if you talk to platoon or troop commanders their nightmare is is losing people um not sort of failing at a mission which of course we're all trying to achieve whatever the whatever your sector but actually losing losing people in your charge because you feel responsible for them so what's ingrained in you from the start is it's a privilege to lead and you need to look after those those you lead it's not a hierarchical seniority thing where you have authority over others uh, it's a privilege that needs to be exercised in the right way it's really interesting that you mentioned that because the kind of perception of people now is actually you should be more of a servant leader. Yeah, I think so. I, th- I think the modern, you know, Generation Z 
even a couple of generations back, we were probably more obedient, for want of a better term. If 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 people t- that were our seniors told us to do something, we didn't always question it. We'd say, that's what I've been told to do. That's what I'm going to do. I think the modern generation is far more curious, far more uh, questioning, and therefore... Uh, you need to be able to take them with you, the hearts and minds. And to do that, you have to be looking after them. And and the thing about good servant leadership is, is the way you unlock discretionary performance as well. So what I mean by that is not just getting someone to do their, their role, what's in their JD, how do you get the extra 10% which isn't in there, which is over and above? And you get that by emotional connection, by creating loyalty, by creating a sense of belonging. So if you do look after people, you get that back in spades in terms of loyalty and commitment. And if you don't, you run the risk of just getting what's on the JD. I'll do what my job is, but I don't feel I have to do any more than that. Do you think you could touch upon how you have utilised this, whether it's servant leadership, transformational leadership, within any of your roles within sport? Because I know, you know, having worked with you, you know, and, and knowing things like the Loughborough Sport Planning Framework and all those elements that you bring to Loughborough Sport, it'd be interesting to get an insight of how you may have tried to achieve that throughout your sporting roles. Yeah, I suppose the bridge to that, Martin, would be a, a grasp of the difference between management and leadership. And sorry, I, I promise I will answer the question, but it's a sort of stepping stone to answering that. That I think I see it all the time in different organisations. People manage when they think they're leading. So they'll talk about leadership and they won't be, they'll be talking about management. They don't understand the difference. And both things are necessary. And to go back to the sort of Santos day, days, Phil Marshall Slim has an amazing quote, which I can't quote exactly. But effectively, he talks about management being uh, the sort of nuts and bolts of what you're about. Um, and it's management is necessary, it's functional. But then he talks about leadership being of the spirit. So management is of the mind. Leadership of the, is of the spirit. It's far more mysterious. But when you get it right, it, you, can, you can achieve amazing things. But some people only ever live in the management world and they think they're leading. So studying that, thinking about it and understanding as a leader, when you manage and when you lead, it's so important. Because in any day, in any hour, in any conversation, you'll flex. You know, so you'll flex from it being in full 90% management mode, talking about process and systems, the tools we need to achieve the task. And then you might flex just two minutes later into 90% leadership. How do I inspire this individual? I've just been talking to about the task. How do I know them to make them motivated, inspired to go away and do this? And in the military, it's about why would you get someone to risk their lives in, in business or sport? It's about trying to move towards optimal performance. So I think, first of all, that realization, understanding when you lead, when you manage, and the importance of each each of the two things to each other. And then I suppose not falling back on management, because management is a, is, is, is a given. You can, you can measure it. You can you can box it off. You can list it. You know, but by definition, it's objective. Whereas leadership is difficult. It's sub- subjective. Do I apply a bit more pressure? Do I take a hard line with this person? Do I, am I more supportive? Do I put an arm around? That's really difficult to judge, and so people don't always want to go there. But I suppose what I learned with time is effective leadership can move mountains, whereas effective management can probably just measure the mountain. You know? So I, for me, um, it was a slow road of getting confidence in my own leadership ability and going to it without trying to defer to management all the time. I love that piece you put in there about leadership being the spirit. Um, I think it, it massively links to culture as well. And some of the definitions that I look at around leadership and culture might be, you know, they're both very difficult to define, but you know when you're around good leaders and, good, and a good culture, you just feel it, you know, mm. you know and, and the opposite is also true. Yeah, so true. I like that. I like that description of culture um, because it's so di- when someone says, all right, talk to me about a, a good high performing culture, you sort of go, I can talk to you about how it feels. I'm not quite sure why I feel that way, but your, your radar sort of um, grows and or becomes more efficient as you go through life because you've been in poor cultures where 
you, you, just, you can just feel it when you walk in a, a room or you spend time with a team, you're going, there's something not right here and I can't put my finger on it. And also when you're going, wow, this is, this is amazing, but I don't know how we've created it. Yeah. <laughs> so and you, it, and you it, know you exactly want to be in that room. You know that, that room where you, where you feel that, you know you want to be in that room and you feel inspired, you know, as, as you mentioned, to be part of that. Whereas when you're in that other room, you might refer back to just the JD, just the job description because you're not mm. inspired you know, to, to take that extra step. Yeah. I think, the, and I, the and I, think, oh. I think the parallel that you're drawing between sort of culture and good leadership is, is appropriate. Um, and, and the link is behaviors. So when, when a leader is behaves in a really strong way, wow, the impact is amazing because you feel good about it. Even when leaders are making hard on popular decisions, there's something about the culture that that's, um, strengthening that's okay but even but even when a leader is or when a leader is maybe making popular decisions in the wrong way it doesn't feel good you know they might be trying to curry favor but it just feels ineffective so it's all about role modeling the right behaviors and understanding what are high performance behaviors for leaders and you you need your leader to do the right thing and create that culture because you know, those those external pressures we mentioned there to just, you know, do what is expected, but is sometimes wrong. You know, it takes a strong leader to go against that when, when the pressure's there externally. And you will inspire those around you if you do make those decisions and you won't inspire them when you don't. Yeah, I mean, I have very, on very few occasions, uh, have, you know, if, if, if leaders are making unpopular decisions for the right reasons. So for instance, you know, we all have to sometimes as leaders part company with team members. Um, I've never once had to do that when the team member uh, has been, they might not have agreed or liked what I've said, but if I've been honest and said it in the right way, they accept it. If you try and tiptoe around that or you're in any way disingenuous, that is when you will get an unhappy person. So I guess we have to be courageous and maybe we're on to courageous conversations. If people think it's truth, however much they don't want to hear it, they end up appreciating it. If people think you're not being straight with them, whatever the message, it's not going to end well. No, to- to- totally agree. I mean, we've gone off tangent slightly there, but it was really, really good topic that I knew would come up with leadership management and we've, we've touched upon culture. So just reflecting back on the development of yourself as a leader, are there you know, situations within the sports environment where you, where you have grown and developed as a leader? Yeah, I think, and it touches on what we talked about. I think to start with, I wanted to learn management skills and we all need those but what it meant was that at times i i reached for those management skills so right we've got a process now in terms of i don't know performance managing an individual that's underperforming and hr has told me under no circumstances do i get into sort of personal chat i go through the process and yeah okay uh, and i i get why that said but suddenly the individual you're talking to feels like an object. They feel like suddenly you're in this ridiculously formal, um, unemotional environment. And they might just want you to hear them out on a few things and talk to them about a few. So you've talked about the sort of progression. I I have, it, with time, I reach for management tools less and I reach for emotional connection more trying to understand if someone's unhappy why, asking them that, trying to help them with solutions. Now, it may end up in the same place at the end of the day, but at least you've, you've tried to take a sort of humane, personal approach to something, not a robotic process one. So there's time for each, but, you know, your, your question was how, I, how I've evolved, and that for me is the major thing. Through the decades and the years of leadership, I think I've become more emotionally based. <laughs> It's a really good point. I mean, I've had situations, you know, leading and managing people like you described. And when you're taking them through that process of, you know, um, right, here's your targets. Have you done this? No. OK. Um, why have you not done this? And and they know they're on this little process of where you're basically saying you've not done what you said you're going to do. I'm going to get rid of you in a few weeks time because I can keep going down this road and HR will then support me and I can get rid of you. That, you know, I've sat there and, and, and done that. But as you said, as you develop and get better at leadership, not necessarily management, I can think of a situation now, really, where leading and that emotional connection and sitting down with somebody who, you know, you know, is a good person, but might not fit 
for the role that they are currently in and having that conversation to say, you know, how are you? You know, what do you want in the future? And, and leading down that road where actually there's a positive outcome that they might leave the organization. So it's the same thing, but they're left with actually some genuine need some genuine development and actually you know this role is just not right for you and, and you're then inspired to move forward you know is that the kind of situation you, you're yeah i mean it, it's one example isn't it but uh and i i just think sometimes we all have to reach for process but it has to be after the personal approach you can't reach for it immediately because the person on the other side of the desk is going can we not have a chat about this why does this have to be so formal and usually we don't go for that chat because it's going to be a difficult chat and when i look back at my my rugby days, I, you know, I was a professional player. I played in the amateur and professional eras. And then I became director of rugby at Northampton Saints. And we had a pretty all-star cast in terms of players there. We had Springboks. We had All Blacks. We had British Lions, England Internationals, Scottish Internationals. We had everybody. And they're all very proud people. And they wanted to do one thing, and that was be involved on a Saturday. And the most difficult conversations were telling people they weren't involved. And sometimes as well, you could say to someone, look, you had a poor performance last week. These are the areas to work on. But other times you're, you're working on an intuitive feel that someone else is better for the next game. And that's a difficult one to explain. You have to say, look, there aren't too many things I, I can criticize about your game at the moment, but I just feel someone else is in a better place. But just having the conversation is appreciated. They're always upset. They're always bit pissed off with you because you're the one that hasn't picked them but in the longer term they appreciate the time you took to talk it through with them but when you avoid those conversations that's where resentment starts to simmer and it and if you don't address it the longer it goes on it gets worse and worse and, and you get into sort of bitter you know um conversations long term and and for me the you know we we had a season where we were we were fighting on three fronts for silverware in the cup in the European Cup and in the Premiership. And long story short, we got the only one we had left right at the end of the season was the European Cup. And we got to the final to play Munster at Twickenham, the last match of a very long season. And I had to pick a squad and then I had to pick 15 people that would run out. And there were people there who had given everything, put their body on the line for 12 months. And I had to tell them, you know what? You're not in this final piece of the, piece of the story. And they were heartbroken because it would have been the biggest game of their life. But you have to eyeball them. You have to face them up and you have to, um, you, you have to have a courageous conversation. And I think the more you do it, the easier it gets. It doesn't get easy, but the easier it gets because you say, you know, I know I'm doing the right thing. The less you do it, the less you front up, the, the sort of more you fear fronting up. How, how did that transition go from being player to director of rugby? Did you, did you feel any changes to your leadership when, when that happened? Yeah, I actually had a break from being player. I, I went and I was director of rugby down at London Scottish, uh, which had leadership challenges of its own, quite, uh, quite fresh into um, professionalism. And then I went back. So the players that were young players when I was a player had now become senior players. So it was interesting with them because... I felt very conscious that I had to have a distance. You know, you can't be one of the lads when you're having to make hard decisions because in the old saying, familiarity breeds contempt, there's an element of truth in that. So although I was familiar, I had relationships, I had to step away. Uh, and you talk about the sort of loneliness of leadership. And, and there is an element of that because, you know, you can't be too close if you're then making decisions about whether they're going to play. And at that time, there could be it could impact on them financially with game bonuses and all the rest of it. So, yeah, I, 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 I consciously created a distance, which which was difficult to do. But the leadership style remain remained the same. I think it maybe became a bit more formal because of what I've just said, because I didn't want it to be too buddy-buddy, because I felt that might, right or wrongly at the time, I felt that might erode uh, any sort of authority I had if I was seen too much to be one of the lads. I think looking back, I probably could have been a bit more relaxed in my approach, but, but I also understand why I took that approach. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose leading on the pitch has got to be different in that it can be a case of give me the ball or making a big tackle or whatever it may be. And I suppose at the side, you, you, you lose them elements a little bit. Yeah, you, you, you know, the, 
with a lot of leadership, you deliver through others. I think, you know, d leading by example in the military or in sport, if you're a platoon commander on operations in the fire, then you're pretty much leading by example. If you're a, a rugby player captaining a team on a pitch, you're leading by example. You're making the tackles. You're doing what you're asking others to do, but trying to do it even better. If you get more senior and you're a general behind the lines or you're a director of rugby off the pitch, you're delivering through others. So it becomes a different style of leadership. It's less role modeling, although you can still role model behaviors, but it's less um, leading by example and more uh, leading by influence. And would you say that kind of continued even more as you progressed and became kind of, you know, MD and executive directors as you are now? Yeah, I think it did. Um, although the, some of the basics of leading teams remain the same, which is you have to be consistent. You have to have integrity. People have to know where your values, what your values are and how you uh, how you live them. Um, and I think if you're authentic in that way, people will forgive you pretty much anything. You know, you can, it's, it's a bit like at Santos, they used to, there's an expression called losing your name in the army. And this was the ultimate. Uh, you people used to say, you know, don't do that or you'll lose your name. And what that meant is uh, you would lose your, your respect, people would lose respect for you and your honor had gone. And it wasn't because you led the charge of the light brigade onto, onto the guns. You could be forgiven that because to her is human. People make mistakes. But if, if, you, if you made a decision based on dishonesty or cowardice or all the things we don't value, then you lose your name. So it's about the person you are, not the technical mistakes you might make. And I think it's the same in rugby. You, you know, you can't be missing every tackle and telling others to tackle. But if you're courageous, if you're supportive of others, if you're, if you're honest about your your gaps and um what you need from others then people will will go with you like you mentioned integrity obviously it takes a lifetime to build that integrity but you can lose it in a second you know if you make those wrong decisions or those wrong behaviors yeah i think so i think as i say it's why you made the wrong decision why you did something wrong so and also the ability to put your hand up it's amazing how many people through not admitting it's their fault actually create a huge issue for themselves you know the way to diffuse a problem is immediately if it's your fault you say you know guys girls i made a, i've made a mistake there i thought this i went with that and it was the wrong thing uh sorry about that i'm going to make up for it. i'm going to move on and they'll just forgive you like that bang uh if you try and screw them out blame others the resentment will grow so just being able to when the time is right stick your hand up and admit you got it wrong or you've got a weakness goes a long way and you mentioned there about leading through others <clears throat> so obviously as you're in a role you know and have been in numerous md kind of ceo type roles how do you lead through others well i think there's it becomes intuitive and a bit instinctive, but you have to understand situational leadership, which again is, is taught at Santa. So I'm always very, uh, I'm always very skeptical of individuals who say, well, this is the type of leader I am, because what they're saying to me is I'm one dimensional. You know, I, I, say, I call a spade a spade me. I do it all the time. That's code for I'm tactless and can't control it. You know, as, as a leader, you need to be able to flex. There's a time to be really decisive, not collaborative, say what you want doing and get the people to do it. There's a time to be completely collaborative and um, empower people to make decisions. There's a time to be forceful. There's a time to be compassionate and listening. Uh, and you have to judge when on that wide spectrum of leadership styles you need to be in what place. Uh, so in terms of leading through others, it depends on the situation and it depends on the individual. That, so those are two moving parts. You need to understand the individual and you need to understand the situation. Then you apply the right way of doing it for that person and, and that situation. And, and, and one size fits all because that's your leadership style means that 50% of the time you're not leading in the right way. You're, you're, not, you're not employing the right style. So as leaders... And this is, it is, this is age old. We need to be adaptable. We need to be nimble. We need to be flexible. And we need to know our people. You know, it, it isn't just because you're trying to 
uh, you're trying to get discretionary performance isn't why you know people. It's because if you know the real individual, you know how to get the best out of them. You know how to optimize their potential. Uh, and to know them you, in, in their entirety, you have to know them personally. So when people walk the floor, and it's so necessary, when you walk the floor, you don't want to be saying, by the way, have you got that project, please, for me? Or have you done that bit of work? You need to be saying... You're a Liverpool supporter. I saw Liverpool lost last night. Oh, what do you reckon? You need to be saying, how's the baby that arrived two weeks ago? You need to be saying, you know, how's the family? I hear your, your, your dad's been ill. Whatever it might be. Because what that does is it creates knowledge of the person and it creates uh, an emotional link, which isn't just transactional business link. Then they are ready to respond to you. You know them well. You know how to get the best out of them. That's <clears throat> it's very, very good advice. Uh, how how do you look at your kind of senior leadership team and what do you surround yourself with? I, I, I potentially know the answer, but I'm just pushing you to, to give it to us. Yeah, no, it, it, it's it's a good point, Martin. And and sometimes it's not, we don't do it knowingly. So I think some leaders fall into the trap of, if people agree with me, I like them. Uh, I'd like to think I'm I'm not that. But also some leaders fall into the people I want to recruit into my team are people I can, I have rapport with. So it's sort of, oh, I get on with them. And then what you find is a team of similar people because they all get on with each other. But of course, what as you get as you get more advanced in, in, in your experience as a leader, you realize that um, differences uh, create the ideal team. And um, there's something we used to call uh, critical friction when, when I was a coach, uh, coaching rugby. And you just want, on that team run before a Saturday game, you want a bit of critical friction. You want a couple of people just... Just losing the temper a little bit with each other, just snapping at each other and just a, the odd niggle. That's not a bad team. That's a team with a nice edge. If they're all sort of chirpy and happy and laughing the whole time and hugging, you know what? In, in, in real extreme performance situations, they, that might fail. So I'm not saying it's a nasty, niggly environment. I'm saying there's a critical friction because they're not all the same. It's the same in leadership teams. You want someone that doesn't see it the same way. So in, in the team I've got at Loughborough at the moment, and you, you know the individuals, they're very different. They see life very differently. But the similarities they have is they have the same values in terms of integrity, uh, commitment, loyalty, but they're seeing the world through different lenses. So what I get is I get the advantage of um, also, uh, you know, being able to look at situations from all angles, not just one dimensional, because we, we're all similar and get on. Uh, and, and that I think is really important, creating teams of difference. It, it adds to making sure you've got a diverse range of leaders and managers in your organization to give you that full perspective. Otherwise, you probably become blinkered because you get group think, you all think the same thing. And, you know, like I turned it, yes, men, that can be conscious or unconscious. You, mm. you could just all turn into yes men because you believe in the same thing. You've got exactly the same, you know, experiences. And that's sometimes a natural thing that you end up recruiting like that. So have you, have you ever consciously recruited in a leadership team for some people who are different? Or is it just, you know, yeah, I, feel? I have. And it took me a while to get there because, uh, of course, when I was younger, I, I failed to know all my gaps. And subconsciously, I would, when I knew there were gaps, I would try and veneer over them, gloss over them. But as you get older, you go, look, there are some gaps here that I've filled because I've developed and learned. There are other gaps. I just don't think I'm ever going to be very good at these things. So I recruited to fill those gaps. And I was very open about it because I've got some strong points and I've got gaps. Others have strong points and gaps. If we can marry the two and it's uh, we cancel out the gaps, then happy days. That's good for everyone. So I think you become more pragmatic with your recruitment, or, or I certainly have, about understanding what makes a good team and understanding all the st- things we will need to deliver a task and where what I don't have to deliver it, where I need to go elsewhere to find it. Yes, yes, it's good to know. You found that's been different. I think I even think still now you're in leadership roles in public, private and kind of charity type sector. Have you found any difference with any of that, any of your leadership style or the potential recruitment of other leaders in any of those roles? Or, or do you th- Bill, it's just similar everywhere. Yeah, I think the latter, actually, Martin. And, and as you say, I've been a chief exec in 
private, public, not for profit, and I'm I'm still doing non-exec work in in those areas as well. And initially, I thought these are very different cultures, and and they were, but the basics are still the same as leaders. You know, you can take away the balance sheet, you can take away the governance, you can take away what type of company this might be. And it's still a group of people with a leadership culture, a followership culture, a team culture that's trying to complete a task, whether it's army, sport, private, public, whatever. And some of the things, the traits we're talking about are consistent through, throughout all of those. So you, as we know, this is this is a podcast where we've already talked, touched upon almost almost every element of leadership that there is out there. And we've already mentioned that, you know, you were taught some of this 40 odd years ago. Um, and it's actually come around still now and it's still relevant. So if you were looking at developing future leaders, what do you see as kind of the future of leadership? And, and how would you advise potential students or, or anybody really to develop in leadership? Well, emotional intelligence. You know, if, if I was saying the first and foremost, I'd get someone who's emotionally intelligent. Because of all the things I talked about, if you're emotionally intelligent, intelligent you're self-aware and you're aware of others. That's the key to leadership. The self-awareness part of leadership is understand how I come across because you are going to be how you behave, what you say and how you say it will impact on the people you're trying to influence to do a task. So if you come across as scary, that isn't a great impact. If you come across as soft and uh, lacking conviction, that's not either. So understand how you come across. And the only way to understand that is to listen to feedback. The more feedback you get. I've had situations where people have said to me after a meeting, you know, when you said that, I think that really upset that person. I was going, what? I didn't mean that. I, I had no idea. You know, I felt really bad. And I need someone to point that out so that I don't do it again. Or similarly, sometimes someone said, wow, when you said that, it really made them feel good. And I was thinking, really, it didn't feel like I said a lot. So, you know, Genghis Khan threatened them with execution if they didn't do what he said. That's one way of influencing people. It doesn't, get, it doesn't sort of work in the modern era. Others try and be very collaborative, very persuasive. Sometimes that's not there. But somewhere on that spectrum, you have to see where you sit and how people see you and respond to you. And that was the bit I, I meant about being aware of individuals and collectives. So I think that the, the, the awareness piece uh, is huge. So I would be looking now in my in my potential leaders of the future, I'd be looking for high emotional intent, intelligence, which um, results in really good self and other awareness. And, and how would you say, so, you, well, two things really. One, you talked about feedback. Have you, have you experienced elements of, of self-reflection to develop as a leader as well? I mean, you've touched upon it. Yeah, I have. And, uh, uh, you know, for me, I, I saw... You know, especially in, in the build up, sort of in the Olympics, uh, Beijing cycle, London cycle, I, I was really lucky to work with a lot of really high performing individuals. And I just watched them and I, I worked out what I liked about them and what I perhaps didn't like so much and didn't want to adopt. But one thing that the really high performers had was a massive hunger for knowledge. You know, you could sit with someone like, you know, Sir Dave Brailsford in, with the cycling team. You could sit with him and after about 40 minutes, you felt exhausted because he had asked you so many questions. He'd sucked all the knowledge out of your head and he may have thrown 90 percent of it away and just kept a few things he liked. And then he did it to the next person and the next person. And it's just this unquenchable thirst for knowledge, which high performing leaders have. And they just build their their techno their technical but, but more than that, their emotional skills. And I think if you ever got to a point where you think you know, know it all, you're probably going to decline as a leader. Yeah, very, very valid point. With, with that then, in terms of your, your leadership, has there been any situations where you think that's been my biggest learning point from leadership? But, you know, maybe, you know, mistakes you feel you've made or, or, or even positive aspects we've reflecting on, you know, that, that was brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I, I had an interesting time at the Rugby Football Union. My, my tenure as, as chief exec there was one year. And I look back on some of it and I have no regrets because I had to, it was a values call. I had certain values that I wasn't going to uh, break or bend or ignore because there were some quite interesting behaviours going on there. But at the same time, I also wonder whether 
I could have been a bit smarter in terms of who I went to for support. So not sort of suffering in silence or making a stand based on my value set, but being a little bit smarter about getting other people to help me in that situation. Um, and I did a certain amount of that, but I think in hindsight, I would have done more. But again, I suppose it's, this is experience. It tells you in that situation, I'd, I'd have approached it in a different way. And hindsight's a wonderful thing. But yeah, I, I think probably at times I've been a, all my life, I've been a values-based leader. And maybe at that time, I didn't have to ignore my values, but I needed to be a bit more pragmatic, a bit smarter and a bit more flexible, if you like. I wanted to touch upon that briefly just regarding experience because just wanted to finish off really now with how how leaders should develop in the future and, and what kind of experiences you feel people should get to potentially improve that emotional intelligence or improve their you know, self-reflection ability. What kind of experience would you expect leaders to try to gain? I think find your role models, you know, find people you respect because there is no formula. There is no benchmark set standard, right? You are now a good leader. It depends who you are. It depends on your character. Trying to emulate someone that doesn't fit you just creates an unauthentic or an inauthentic style, which people will see through. So pick up the, the best practice from lots of different leaders and create your own model of leadership. What suits you as a character? You get introvert leaders, you get extrovert leaders, um, you get very collaborative leaders, you get very dogmatic leaders. None of them are right or wrong. The, the, in the end, the acid test is whether they get the job done in a humane way with a, it, it, with, you know, a good value set. So, so I think for me, it's, it, it's creating... Uh, your own style and not being told that this is exactly the way to do it. Form a, uh, you know, a, t a tailored bespoke suit for yourself, not one off the peg. And is, are there any specific experiences that you think students or, you know, potential managers and leaders should gain to, to develop at all? I, I think, you know, you have to, you have to lead, you have to follow. Uh, we lead and follow, uh, in every minute of every hour of every day, you know, one, one second with in a leadership role and leading doesn't mean you're, you've got people you line managed. Leadership is a set of behaviors. You might I line manage no one and be a really inspirational leader. So I, I think that's really important to understand, but yes, the experience, I mean, in a world where social media has likes to press and everyone on any sport tends to whoop and do nine cartwheels and, pull their shirt off and swing it around their head if they score a goal. I guess I'm a bit old-fashioned, but I admire a bit of humility. I admire people who are understated. And there is nothing more that I admire than a, a really effective, understated leader. That, I think, is a wonderful traits to have. John, I'm going to leave it there with you. I know you've had a very busy day and you know I can ask you questions about leadership all day, <laughs> so I won't continue. But I think we've really touched upon lots of elements there of leadership um thanks for giving us your experiences and showing us your you know your understanding of leadership um and yeah i look forward to speaking to you in the future and hopefully see you in the corridor soon when we're allowed back in thanks martin thanks for chats i enjoyed it thanks john thanks for listening to experts in sport if you'd like to get in touch to discuss any topics that you'd like to hear about then contact me martin foster via my email m.foster at albera.ac.uk. Bye for now. See you next time.